on World War Struck. Dangling in the air, Loka struck in a cable car dangling hundreds of meters above ravine in Pakistan for 14 hours. Trump surrenders. Trump announces that he will surrender himself to Fulton County in Georgia to face election charges. Moon mission. India on course to make history with Chandrayaan 3 South Pole moon landing. Cat Cafe. Meow Cat Cafe in Gaza Strip brings cat lovers joy while boosting awareness over pet raising. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News. We start with startling news from Pakistan where all eight people who were stuck in a cable car dangling hundreds of meters above a ravine for many hours have now been rescued. In a slow and dangerous operation, a military helicopter rescued one child while teams on the ground recovered the rest of the group after dark. This was the moment the final two trapped people made it to safety after a 15-hour ordeal. It all started around 7 a.m. when six boys and two men boarded a cable car on their way into school, as this rescued teen recounted. When the chairlift was halfway there, the cable snapped. It was dangling and I was terrified. I thought it was my last day and it was over for me. Cable car was dangling some 300 meters above a remote valley in Batagram. Six hours passed before the rescue began. It was like doomsday for the area. Everyone rushed out of their homes, including our children, our mothers and sisters, because our children use the cable car every day. As anxious relatives and locals gathered to watch on both sides of the ravine, a helicopter plucked first one, then a second child from the cable car. Rescue officials said the mission was complicated by wind and the fact that the helicopter's rotor blades risked further weakening the lift. As night fell, rescue efforts shifted to the ground, with military commandos using the one cable still intact as a makeshift zip line. Once all eight were finally pulled to safety, Pakistan's interim prime minister expressed his relief and congratulated the rescuers. He also ordered safety inspections of the country's cable cars and chairlifts, which are regularly used by Pakistanis to get around its mountainous regions, but are often poorly maintained. Next, this evening, to the former President Trump, who is now preparing to surrender to authorities in Fulton County, Georgia, Trump says he'll be arrested on Thursday to face charges of allegedly scheming to overturn the 2020 election. Tonight, Donald Trump announcing he's preparing to surrender, posting on social media, can you believe it? I'll be going to Atlanta, Georgia on Thursday to be arrested. The former president expected to be fingerprinted and have his mugshot taken before he's released on a $200,000 bond, twice as big as the bond of any of his co-defendants so far. He'll have to put up 10% before he's let out. Today, some of Trump's 18 alleged co-conspirators beginning to arrive at the Fulton County Jail to turn themselves in, including lawyer John Eastman, allegedly the architect of a criminal scheme to send fake electors to Washington to block Joe Biden from being certified the winner and keep Trump in power. After he was booked, Eastman denying he did anything wrong, still pushing lies about the 2020 election. As a condition of release, Eastman and the others agree to perform no act to intimidate any witness or co-defendant or to otherwise obstruct the administration of justice. Trump has an extra condition. He cannot make threats against potential witnesses, including posts on social media. India is preparing for its second attempted moon landing, a historic moment for the world's most populous country. Chandrayaan 3, which means mooncraft in Sanskrit, is scheduled to put down its Vikram lander near the little explored lunar south pole in what would be a world first for any space program. A previous Indian effort failed in 2019 and the latest mission comes just days after Russia's first moon mission in almost 50 years, destined from the same region, crashed on the lunar surface. Former Indian space chief K. Sivan said the latest photos transmitted back by the lander gave every indication the final leg of the voyage would succeed. Sivan added that the Indian Space Research Organization had made corrections after the failure four years ago, when scientists lost contact with the lunar module moments before its slated landing. The mission launched nearly six weeks ago, in front of thousands of cheering spectators, taking much longer to reach the moon than those of the Apollo mission in 1960s and the 1970s, which arrived in a matter of days. 
India is using rockets much less powerful than the US did back then. Instead, the probe orbited Earth several times to gain speed before embarking on its month-long lunar trajectory. The latest mission comes with a price tag of $74.6 million, far lower than those of other countries, in keeping with India's frugal space engineering. In 2014, India became the first Asian country to put a satellite into orbit around Mars and is slated to launch a crewed mission into Earth's orbit in the next few years, starting with uncrewed test flights in 2024. Only Russia, the US and China have previously achieved a controlled landing on the lunar surface. The International Atomic Energy Agency vows to maintain an on-site presence at Fukushima Daiichi during and after releasing the water amid a mixed reaction from the international community, some expressing strong opposition. The International Atomic Energy Agency will review the situation during and after the discharge of Fukushima wastewater. Following the announcement by the Japanese government on Tuesday, the IAEA published a statement on its website saying that its staff on site will continue to monitor and assess the activities to ensure their ongoing alignment with safety standards, including on the day of the discharge starting and after. The agency has staff stationed in a Fukushima office that was opened last month where South Korea will also send its experts. The IAEA experts there will directly observe the process of collecting wastewater samples. While regularly visiting related facilities, they will coordinate discussions between the IAEA and Tokyo Electric Power Company if any changes occur. It also plans to publish data for the use of the global community, including real-time monitoring information. An additional update will be provided as soon as the discharge begins. Unlike the United States, which has been supportive of the discharge, China has criticized Japan's latest decision. China strongly urges Japan to rectify its wrongful decision and withdraw its plan to discharge nuclear contaminated water into the sea. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson added that Beijing will take necessary measures to safeguard food safety and the health of its people. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee on Tuesday said he strongly opposes the decision, saying the city would immediately activate import controls on Japanese seafood. On the other hand, the European Union last month decided to remove its import restrictions on Japanese food that had been in place since the nuclear accident in 2011. Meanwhile, the environmental organization Greenpeace has criticized Japan's latest decision, arguing that it violates human rights in both Japan and the Pacific region and that it ignores the concerns of people, including fishermen. British Columbia Premier David Abbey stated that wildfires ravaging Canada's British Columbia province are showing some signs of easing and the weather conditions should improve through into the week, although crews are still battling epic blazes. Canadian firefighters are on the front foot. After record wildfires forcing tens of thousands from their homes, rain is forecast and relief seems on the way, though lightning and high winds remain a possible risk. While we're expecting some more favourable weather, I understand the situation is still incredibly serious across the province. Thousands of firefighters are still deployed in British Columbia and hundreds of fires are still burning, while more than 60,000 people remain either evacuated or under orders to be ready to evacuate. Meanwhile, in the Northwest Territories, rain is dampening fires that forced about 60% of the population from their homes, in some cases leaving devastation behind. Canadians from coast to coast to coast are watching in horror the images of apocalyptic uh, devastation and fires going on in uh, communities that so many of us know and so many of us have friends in. One major health hazard could linger until September, smoke. Much of the southern half of British Columbia was put under air quality warnings and in some towns the smog was more than three times as bad as that of the most polluted city in the world, Lahore. We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. Over in Johannesburg, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa will meet to access the group's expansion and boost their currencies against the West. Russian President Vladimir Putin is the only leader not expected to attend the summit. 
His participation will be virtual with his Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov representing the Russian Federation in person. As leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa convene for a three-day summit, one item on the agenda is whether they should allow other countries to join their BRICS group, which is already home to 40% of the world's population. The idea is to offer a counterweight to a world order dominated by wealthy Western nations, and it's finding resonance among members. Our countries, united, represent one-third of the global economy. This relevance will grow with the entry of new members and partners. Both Russia and China are keen on expansion, seeing it as a way to promote their own agendas and rival the G7. After arriving in South Africa earlier in the day, Chinese President Xi Jinping skipped Tuesday's event for an unspecified reason. But in a speech read on his behalf by the Chinese Minister of Commerce, he accused unnamed countries of suppressing them. Some countries, unwilling to give up their hegemonic position, have arbitrarily blocked and suppressed emerging market countries and developing countries, curbing whoever is developing well. India is more wary, unwilling to let BRICS become another venue for Chinese dominance. The group is also championing its own development bank as an alternative to the World Bank and the IMF. Vladimir Putin said independence from the dollar was also gaining steam among the BRICS. The objective and irreversible process of the de-dollarization of our economic ties is gaining momentum. As a result, the share of the dollar in export-import operations within the framework of the BRICS is declining. Putin did not show up in person and sent a pre-recorded video because of an international warrant for his arrest accusing him of war crimes in Ukraine. He also sent as his deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who was greeted off the plane by traditional dancers. Moscow's invasion has done little to dent Russia's support from its BRICS partners, who have either refused to condemn it or imposed sanctions on it. Thailand's former Prime Minister Thaksin Sinvata has been jailed upon returning to the country after 15 years in exile. But many believe he has struck a deal that will keep him from serving more than a short period in prison. Thailand's former Prime Minister greeted supporters at a Bangkok airport as he returned to his home country for the first time since 2008. Thaksin Sinawat fled abroad 15 years ago before he was jailed in absentia for abuse of power. His return to Thailand came as real estate mogul Seik Tatawi Sin on the backing of the country's parliament to become prime minister. Seik Tatawi Sin is the candidate of the Poor Thai Party, which was founded by Thaksin. His win paves the way for a new coalition government and brings an end to weeks of uncertainty. Before the vote, Thaksin appeared briefly with family members at the private jet terminal smiling and waving to hundreds of supporters. He was then escorted by police to the Supreme Court and on to prison to serve a term of eight years. Thailand had been locked in a political stalemate since an election in May swept the anti-establishment move forward to victory. The Progressive Party was blocked by Conservative lawmakers and now the Pure Thai Party is expected to form a government. The party has agreed a contentious alliance that includes parties backed by the military. The same military that led coups in 2006 and 2014 against Taksin and his sister, who also had a stint as Prime Minister. Seit Tatawi Sin's smooth ascent to the top job and Taksin's return may fuel speculation that the former Prime Minister did a deal with his enemies in the military to allow for his return and possibly an early release from jail. Escalating tensions between Washington and Beijing as the United States has made clear that it doesn't want the Chinese economy to tumble, calling on Beijing to be more transparent about the state of its economy. Washington also removed some Chinese entities from its export-controlled unverified list. Last week, the Chinese government stopped the publication of a report on soaring youth unemployment amid concerns the statistics would reveal new weaknesses in the country's recovery. China also cracked down on corporate due diligence firms operating in the country, halting the flow of information to overseas businesses. 
In response, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Tuesday called on Beijing to be more transparent about the state of its economy. Speaking to reporters in Washington, Sullivan said that for global confidence, predictability, and the capacity of the rest of the world to make sound economic decisions, it's important for China to maintain a level of transparency in the publication of its data. His comments also come as U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is set to travel to China at the end of this month for talks with high-level Chinese officials in what seems to be a move by Washington to stabilize relations with Beijing. Raimondo's trip follows a four-day visit by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last month, who held more than 10 hours of meetings with senior officials in Beijing. Meanwhile, in a bid to further normalize bilateral trade with China, the U.S. Department of Commerce announced Tuesday that it has removed 27 Chinese entities from its export control unverified list. The Chinese Commerce Ministry welcomed the decision, saying that the move is in line with the common interests of the two sides. The ministry added that solutions that would be beneficial to both countries can be found as long as the two sides follow the principle of frank cooperation and mutual benefit. Now, road to the White House, where we give you all the U.S. election updates. The biotech entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, a contender for the Republican presidential nomination, was condemned for conspiracy-ting remarks about the events of 9-11 and the January 6 attack on the Capitol. In the Atlantic press well, Ramaswamy did not confine his conspiracy-laced remarks to 9-11. Ramaswamy, then DeSantis and other candidates are due to appear in the first debate in Milwaukee and Ramaswamy's remarks about 9-11 seem likely to be raised. Seeking to appeal to Trump voters, Ramaswamy seemed eager to cover similar ground. When asked if he thought 9-11 was an inside job or happened exactly like the government tells us, he stated that he didn't believe that the government had told the truth. Ramaswamy further said that he was referring to what is known or not known about links between the 9-11 attackers and the government of Saudi Arabia. In that conversation, Ramaswamy said controversy over his comments about 9-11 would not prove a campaign enter, adding that he explicitly believed that the government, the 9-11 Commission and the FBI lied to the public. Ramaswamy launched his presidential campaign as a rank outsider but has proved and improved in polling to challenge Ron DeSantis, the hard-right governor for Florida, for second place to Trump. Welcome back. For more news, let's stay around the world. The Roscosmos Progress 85 cargo and unmanned Soyuz spacecraft rocketed into space from Kazakhstan to resupply the International Space Station. A second will launch from Florida to send four new crew members to the orbital lab. Officials from Mexico's INN Migration Institute said in a statement that 15 Mexicans and one Venezuelan were killed in a road accident in central Mexico. The injured were transferred to local hospitals and Mexican authorities are set to return the body of one deceased Venezuelan back to their home country. Peruvian Obinus volcano registers two explosions, leaving nearby towns covered in ashes over a month of no reported activity. The month of August 2023 marks the sixth anniversary of the fleeing of Rohingya from Myanmar's Rakhine state to Bangladesh after a major raid cracked down in response to an attack by Muslim militants in Myanmar's security posts. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke to members of the country's armed forces at a flag ceremony in Kyiv as the country marked the National Flag Day. The ceremony was held on the eve of Ukraine's Independence Day. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in the Gaza Strip, where the first feline cafe was installed for the joy of cat lovers. Thank you for watching. Good night.